Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Arizona Deliverance Center. Um, so this is my first time up here. So um, thank you for coming today. It's a great place to be at to receive some, some peace and some deliverance. Um, we have meetings um, on Tuesdays at 6.30. Um, here coming up on September, September 12, 2023. And then um, if you guys want to get on, online on the computer, um, Rick has an amazing deliverance service that he does on Wednesday nights. Um, and then you'll go to the steps of deliverance. Um, you'll shoot them an email and they'll send you a link. So you'll be able to hop on those calls. There is some amazing deliverance going on during that time. And um, Rick kind of um, talks for about an hour. And then at 7 o'clock, he starts praying for people um, to seek deliverance. Um, and then, of course, here on Thursdays at 7 o'clock, there is also um, a message and um, prayer as well. And then, um, so with that being said, I'd like to pray. Heavenly Father, we come here today um, to seek peace and seek deliverance. Lord, uh, bless us with your presence and um, allow Rick to give us a solid message and for us to seek that peace that we so um, seek, Lord. And I pray that everyone here um, receives um, what they're looking for, Father, and um, I pray that you give Rig the wisdom as you always do, and give them the words that we need to hear. Amen. And now, um, Rick, coming up. Amen. Testing, testing, testing. Thanks. Good job. Testing, testing, testing. Whew. Hey, people made it through the weather. It's not like we're in Flagstaff where there's three foot of snow. It's just cold and a little rainy. My son's been in a second-story guest house, locked in there since Tuesday because he's on crutches and can't put any weight on his foot, can't leave the house. I said, I'll come up Sunday and dig you out. So we're blessed. Well, I want to encourage you because, man, this thing is a battle. Some people it clicks really well with. Some people understand a fight mentality. Sports are good for something. If you've ever played sports, you realize you got to fight for your position. Mm -hmm. I've seen some uber-talented people in college. That boy in the springtime and the summer conditioning, they had it all. Man, they ran like gazelles. They jumped like deer. They lifted all the weights in the world. But when it came down on the field, nobody could figure it out why they couldn't get the job done. And uh, the only thing I could come to a conclusion was it was a lack of focus or it was a lack of belief. Even though you had all these attributes, I don't know why you wouldn't believe. Well, that's what it comes down to in deliverance of those who get set free and those th who stay entangled, is believing that God has given you superior strength over the devil. He's given you all power over the devil. Well, we have to use it scripturally. You can't use it out of context. You have, have to use it as it was spoken. And you got to use it by faith. You have to have faith. You have to believe God's word. You have to believe he loves you. You got to believe he wants to help you. You got to believe that this power is superior over the devil's power. And then fear, as you begin to advance the kingdom of God, you leave fear. Oh, the disciples, you don't. You don't see them later on after the resurrection of Christ and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, them operating with fear. Fear has to do with torment, and perfect love cast out fear. So when you get saved, you're supposed to grow in the knowledge and the love of Jesus Christ where you would love him back. And loving him back is doing what he commanded you to do. And he says, if you do what I command you to do, then you truly are my friends. There's a lot of people that aren't friends of God, and they don't even know it. He loves them. They've been born again. They got the red carpet, so to speak, laid out for them. But they don't do what God called them to do. And those are what we call, and are described in the Bible, as snares of the devil, entanglements, webs of deception, bondages, chains, when you do something that you know you shouldn't do. And if you do it repetitively, then it says in the Bible, that's a practice. 
And it says, hey, once you make a practice of sin, this excludes you from all types of attributes and blessings in the Bible. Because God is the author of perfection. He's not, he doesn't bring confusion. So he's going to bless you when you're walking right. And that's why a lot of people are confused because when you first get saved, man, I, I prayed five prayers. First one, I go, oh, that's, 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 yeah, that's interesting because God answered it. I said, well, I didn't know if it was really God. I mean, things have went my way numerous times. The second time I prayed, I said, wow, I mean, this is, could this be? I mean, that's pretty specific. The third time I said, look, man, this is requiring me to make some changes. If, if God is hearing me and he's answered, I said, okay, one more. And he answers another one, and I get a little bit of fear. I'm like, oh, my goodness. He sees it all. He hears all my thoughts, my negative emotions. So what happens is you get to the point of God moving on your behalf, and you go to the realization that he's real, that he's your ever-present help in your time of need. I said, if he answers one more prayer, I got to change my life. And I was five for five. I was five for five, and I said, uh-oh, this is real. He sees it all. There's no hiding. There, there's, I, when I changed my life, and I was a ticket scalper with Charles Barkley was here, I mean, it was literally like, just go down and make $1,000. You could make 2000 in a night with just coming down with no tickets and money in your pocket. It was an easy business. And I was working an event, and, I, and we, they put us in this little area. You couldn't just, couldn't be a free-for-all. They started implementing some kind of rule, and we were all in this, this little 50-yard uh, by 50-yard little area designated for buying and selling tickets. And we called it the cage. They had us caged up. And, uh, man, you get to fighting. I mean, there's some people in that business that have drug addiction. There's some people that are, have gambling addiction. There's some people just out of their minds for themselves. And so, man, there's guys, I'm trying to block them out of my corner and hold them back from cutting off the deal and trying to undersell the price or pay more than I'm about to pay for some tickets. And I went home and I said, I said, man, I had just got saved. I just got added into the church. I was excited about my church life. And I said, man, what would that look like if someone from my church would see me fighting for that money like that? I mean, this is getting a little savage. And I heard God's voice, and he says, how come you don't consider the way I feel about you acting like that? It was the, another level wake-up call. And I realized this job isn't for me. This isn't for me. This isn't what God called me to do. This is what I bumped into when I walked aimlessly, when I walked as a self-seeker and a, a person searching for his own personal pleasure. That's how I found that job. That wasn't the leading and the guiding of the Holy Spirit. There was no questions in my mind. So now you have to, in your life, make changes. Oh, that's a radical change, especially for a guy that went to college, got 135 credits and two years away from a degree. Some people don't know how that's even possible. And I'll tell you, it's by doing the bare minimum just to be eligible. And now I got to gotta go over and do something useful with my life. And I said, whoa, man, there was a battle. That job and that money, that had an ability to pull on my heart to say, well, what are you going to do? It had a voice. What can you do? This is what you were good at. You are good at this. You're one of the best there is. You go over here, you have no education. What are you going to do? What, 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 what kind of money can you make? And the devil started telling me about my future. And I didn't even know it was the devil. He's a masterful deceiver. And whenever you, you're not walking by faith as a Christian, you, you, by definition, you're walking by sight. What you can understand in your human reasoning, what you can understand through others' past experience or your prior past experiences, and you make decisions based on sight. We're supposed to make decisions based on the faith of God's word. If God led me out of something, then it should have been an easy understanding that he was going to lead me into something. But when you leave something, you have to wrestle. You're not wrestling flesh and blood. You're not wrestling yourself. You're wrestling principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly realms. He's wrestling with you so that you don't overcome and fulfill your destiny because it takes faith. That's the fighting. Most people don't understand 
fighting the devil. The devil, the Bible tells you who he is. He's the father of lies. He's the master of deception. You can't deceive somebody unless you've lied to somebody. So then he puts a network of lies into your mind so that you can't overcome, so that you can't believe for a victory. And then when spirits get involved, they hyper-accentuate everything. They hyper-accentuate people's sexuality. I help them all the time. They masturbate two, three times a day. When I was working with the sex offenders downtown, they would say, hey, look, man, this is a scan it for any children here. Got children, put your earmuffs on online. They would masturbate. The only thing would stop is when their genitals would start bleeding. What would ha- this is an extreme case of hyper accentuation of natural desires. When you're married, you're supposed to unveil and awaken your sexual desires for your husband, for your, your wife, and the two become one flesh, and then you're to keep that special for just you two and undefiled, and it was given by God. But we have that nature. We have a sexual nature, and so if it's opened up before its appropriate time because of ignorance, because of deception, because of willful sin, whatever the case is, there's no exceptions that when you walk down that door, whatever the reason is, you open that door, rather, you get spirits, and they're going to deceive you. Some, spirit, some people stand on a level of morality, like, hey, I had a friend, he was a Christian. I used to cringe when he would talk to our coach. He was, he was a year older than me, or he was a class ahead of me, and uh, we were in junior college, and he was trying to go on and, and get a scholarship to a four-year school, and he was talking to the coach, and he was quoting all these Bible verses. And I'm like, you and Bible verses? Well, how do you even know those? Is this, this some kind of hustle? Like, where'd you come up with this hustle? We're looking in the Bible and actually able to sell them as a part of your sales pitch. But later I found out he did get born again when he was a kid and uh, somewhere in his teens. And God sent a family to him to really help him. His dad was an alcoholic, and he was from a divorced family. And a family basically raised him and paid for him to go to school and got him a car in high school. And God really blessed him. But he never overcame sexually, so I only knew him as a guy that at that point was a little envious. He was a blonde-haired, blue-eyed surfer, California guy, and he had all the pretty girls. And he thumb through them like it was a hobby. It was a hobby. And so that's what I knew him as a fornicator. But he had gotten saved. Then later in life, I saw him. We've talked God before. And he, and he said, hey, Rick, how is it that you have all this success? How are, you, how are you making these disciples? How are you getting people to convert? I preach to them all the time. I'm always preaching. I'm always sharing scriptures with all my friends. I hardly see any success. It's almost always trampled down. It's almost always quenched every time I get it going. Even if someone's alive for a little while, it doesn't last long. Well, the reality is you overcome by the blood of the lamb what he did for humanity and then by the word of your testimony, how that blood cleansed you and how your faith in his word changed you. The power of the Holy Spirit changed you. He never overcame. So one of the times I saw him, I saw him at a a shoe store, and he broke out his phone. He's like, man, you won't believe this. I was dating the playmate of the year. Oh, no, I'm not going to show you the nude photo. I'm just going to show you your photo, just us together. And and he's like, yeah, I had to stop because too many men would, would Google after her, you know, and just come up to her wanting the autographs and literally drool and act like I wasn't there at restaurants and and places that we would go, and I couldn't take it anymore. And I'm like, man, this is some powerful spiritual deception that you can't understand that these men have had a sexual soul tie with your girlfriend because they've had sex with this woman in their mind dozens or hundreds, possibly thousands of times, and Jesus had upped the ante and said, you've heard of old that you shall not commit adultery, but I say that if you lust after a woman in your heart, you've committed adultery with her. And so they were adulterers with this woman. They were in a delusion between a fantasy world and reality. Their reality, having sexual stimulation, their reality, their eyes are seeing something, but it's a delusion because they've never physically seen the actual person. And he couldn't figure this out. He couldn't figure it out. Why? Because Satan will blind your mind. 
He will blind you from understanding the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He will blind you from the love of Jesus Christ. And then he will blind you from the call that every person has from Jesus Christ. You are called and you are given a spiritual gift. Everyone has at least one. I've met some that have three and four of them. And the gifts weren't given to give validity to you. So when people saw you, you'd be special and they'd follow you around. No, the gifts were given that it would build other people up and bless them according to their needs. That's, that's how the Holy Spirit worked in each and every individual and the church became stronger. God no longer dwelt in the buildings made by the hands of men, but he lives in us living stones. And then we're built together for good works. And so when you've been blinded, the only way out is you have to fight for the truth. Going back to what I said, some people can get delivered fast and some people get delivered very slow. And the people that get delivered fast can say, hey, I got to fight for this. Hey, this devil is going to oppose me. They, they do a little reflection in your past life saying he has opposed me. Every time that I try to do something for God, there has been opposition. There has been some sort of of confusion on my part there's been some sort of breakthrough whenever I was able to do something on a continual basis there had to be a breakthrough I see it with every guy in the jails unfortunately unless you're going in there telling a message that the devil wants you to say you know then there's no there's a red carpet from the devil to get in and preach that stuff but when you're coming in there preaching the broken body of Jesus Christ there is opposition so there was there's two camps of, of people that go in those jails and preach it's normally elderly people and those are normally people that were raised, uh, you know, in a time where sin wasn't at your fingertips. Sin's always been available, and sin comes right out of our heart. But they didn't live in a practice of sin. These are people that normally never seen drugs, never been an alcoholic. You know, they, they just got in the church, raised in the church, went to work, hardworking people from the raised up in the 50s and 60s, some even older than that. And... Then there's these young guns that come out, and they got these stories, and they got these testimonies, man. They were part of the white knights and the black, you know, whatever, devils and the, all these weird gang-banging, thugging stories. And they come hard, and they get saved, and they got a lot of passion, and they got a lot of energy, and they got a lot of people praying behind them, and people are amazed at the stories. You know, wow, you were doing this, and wow, you were doing that. But the reality is... That's a wow story, but you got to keep going now. And so what happened is they had incredible testimonies, but at one point you got to keep going. Now you got to be a victorious servant. Now you got to be a person that lays down his life for his brothers. It takes sacrifice to raise a, uh, to make a disciple. It takes a lot of patience. It takes a lot of kindness. It takes a lot of understanding. It takes the ability just to sit back and wait for God to make a move, knowing that you don't have the pieces to move at this point. That person has to see the hand of God to go further, and so you sit back and you pray and you intercede for them. And so what happens, they would burn out, and then they would last about a year, some of them two years, but that was about the norm. And so this devil doesn't want us growing. That's why he put in childhood wounds of rejection, that's why he put in fear. That's why he put in this, this isolation and this sense that nobody loves you, nobody really cares, no one's really willing to reach out and get any help to you. You're, you're abandoned. And sometimes it's different. But those people have a hard time growing until you overcome that you're not rejected anymore. You're the beloved of God. You have to realize what the scripture says, that, yeah, that sounds like a last place life. I, I had a pretty good life. I had a pretty good life. Any trouble I got into, I, I, I caused it myself. But I've met a lot of people where hell came to breakfast for them. Evil things happened to them at a young age. They got involved in sins that at five and six and seven, I would have never crossed my mind. I, I would have I, I never imagined something like that. And they got introduced into it. Because the sins of the fathers are passed down to the children, and somehow those spirits were moving and allowed in that house. And so because that's so traumatic, they have a hard time overcoming because they think who they used to be is who they are now. But the scripture is clear that if anyone is in Christ, behold, he is a new creation. 
That instantly happens in your spirit, man. It doesn't say it instantly happens in your mind. It says you renew your mind according to the word of God. To renew your mind means it needs to operate new. It needs to be able to function biblically. That means you hear the word and you do the word. But when your mind's not renewed, you can hear the word, but this rejection blocks it and says, not for you. If that was you, then this wouldn't have happened. If that was for you, then all these good things would happen. And you have to overcome. You have to overcome sexual deviance. You have to overcome drug and alcohol addiction. You have to overcome poor self-worth, loneliness. If you've ever been into witchcraft, those spirits take some time to get rid of because they're so smart. You went up the food chain, so to speak. You know, if you go down here to the neighborhood bar and and uh, you've been hitting a punching bag, and you're not stone-faced drunk, you're going to be probably pretty victorious down there at Hamburger Works. There's not too many formidable foes down there, I would imagine. And, but you want to go on down here to Rodriguez Boxing Gym on, on Grand Avenue and jump in there with someone that started boxing at 13, now he's 23, looking for a payday, because he's hungry and can't find any other job than fighting for a, for a small purse of five and six hundred bucks. You're, you're going to run into a guy that's going to put it to you. Well, once you go to witchcraft, you, you've went up to the experts. You, you've went, when the New Age, you went to an expert deceiver. I mean, you talk about Satan. He is the masterful deceiver. Then you have demons that are just basic liars. There's simple demons. There's, there's devils of, of religion that just gets you caught up. Oh, I can't leave this church. I was raised in this church. This church is my culture. These are my friends. That's a pretty elementary spirit that's going to lock you down when you can see the truth. This is what you were raised with for 15 years, didn't understand anything, had no victory, no signs, wonders, and miracles, never saw one in that church. And now God starts doing miracles. Well, he's opening your eyes to say, hey, you got to overcome those traditions of men. you got to overcome this and what you were indoctrinated in, that's a pretty simple spirit. But when you're going up saying, hey, I want some power, because no one's going to witchcraft unless you want some power, you want some wisdom, you want some insight, you want some physical uh, blessing, something to manifest itself to you that you don't have to work by the sweat of your brow for, that it's just going to come your way. Well, you have went up to an expert. You have went up to some kind of professional deceiver. So now you have to fight through at another level because you got into a fight at a level that you didn't understand. So you got to go and you got to realize I'm fighting here. So if I go down and I thought I was tough because I, I boxed up some of these drunk golfers that have been golfing all day drinking at Hamburger Works. And I went down and got beat up down there at, uh, at Rodriguez Boxing Gym by some guy who's in it to win it. Well, if I'm fighting him and I'm committed to the fight till I have victory over him, I got to go lay in the groundwork. I better start getting in my conditioning. I better start getting in my strength. I better start getting all the attributes it would take for me to win that victory. So you need to be strong in God. You have to know his word. You have to have people around you praying for you that would stand in agreement with you until you see the victory. And when you get people around you, that's why I said surround yourself with a cloud of great witnesses. So that means you trust them. So when they tell you something, that you got, you got to look within. Those people helped you get delivered. They helped you get healed. Those people have made disciples before. I got to trust them. Out of all the people I've saw and all the people that I've interacted with in my life, these are the people that bear fruit. These are the people, even though it's hard for me to understand and hard to believe because I'm wrestling with something, I got to believe them. They got the scriptures to back it up. They've got past victories in this area. I have to trust them. So that's why in Christianity, you got to know one another and you got to be known by one another. Otherwise, everyone kind of hides in secret. You get to the mega church. How you doing, brother? Stay prayed up. Hallelujah, man. How about those cardinals? I mean, you got these four or five one-liners. You work through the crowd and, and maybe you see them at the church banquet once a year and see them in the child care line when you're set, checking your kids in. But nobody really knows each other. It, it, and that's the way Satan wanted to design. So you would be afraid. I didn't want to tell anyone my testimony that used to be a ticket scalper. I was like, that's not going to go over well. There's no sense telling anybody where I've been from. That will only be seen as a negative light. And I'll be put in a certain 
craft, uh, demographic of people they can trust at what, whatever level I fit in, in their minds. I'm not going to tell anybody that I'm struggling when I was trying to find a job and I felt like going back. But what I needed was some encouragement. I needed someone to tell me, uh, hey, I had victory. My brother Tony, he was an engineer. He said, I couldn't find a job for two years. I had a house. I had all these things. And it's not like I could do, do anything else. I've been an engineer for 18 years. And then how God was teaching him faith. God was teaching him how to press in, and he pressed through and found victory. I could have gleaned off that story, and what took me uh, six, eight months of wrestling before I could humble myself and trust God, I could have bypassed months of that, at least weeks with that testimony and hanging on to that and getting that brother to pray for me. That's why you got to know and you got to fight with fellow brothers through this sin-stained world so that you become an overcomer, so that you get what God wants you to have, eyes to see and ears to hear, so that you can walk in victory. Amen. Well, let me share a few scriptures with you. It'll show us how to walk in victory. Matthew chapter 16, and when Jesus came to the region of uh, Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do they say the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and then some say Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So that's the first basic elementary principle of Jesus Christ, is you have to realize you did not discover Jesus Christ. You, you, you weren't the God seeker trying all these different religions and you found the right one. No, Jesus was revealed to you by the Father because he was looking for you. That's why he sent his son in the first place, one that would live the life you were required to live, one that ultimately would go on the cross and die the death you deserve, one that would pour out his innocent shed blood for the remission of your sins, one that went to hell, but God raised him from the dead on the third day, and that would be the guarantee that one day you will rise. So with that revelation of who Jesus is, you have to realize when we rise from the dead, we're going to give an account. We're going to give an account for what we did. The Bible says it's so in detail, you'll even give an account for every idle word you spoke. You, you'll, you'll give an account if you gave place to the devil. You'll give an account if the devil put a hold or a snare or put an entanglement on you and you didn't fight through it with the power that he gave you. He gave us the power over the devil's power. Oh, we're going to get to it. Watch this. And then he says this. He says, this was revealed by my Father in heaven. And he says, and I say to you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. He, he, the rock is Jesus Christ. Peter's not the rock. He said, on this rock, on this fact that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. That's the rock. And he says, and I'm going to build my kingdom upon this rock. I'm going to build my church. And it says, the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. The devil's not going to prevail against what God wants to do. If you come into agreement with what God wants to do in your life, the devil will not prevail over you. Well, when you come into agreement with it, remember, faith has to be working together with action. Because Paul says, if you have faith, but you don't have any works, that faith grows stagnant. That faith, faith eventually dies. It, it's, it's of no value. So faith with action is believe in the Lord. You're being built upon Jesus. You're, you're understanding the revelation of who you are through Christ. You're understanding the power that he gave you. That's the rock. And he says this. And he says uh, in verse 18, Now I say to you, Peter, that on this rock I'll build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. The keys. You get the keys for what works. Well, hey, I got five keys. This, this building is a little bit hieroglyphics. Uh, you got to have a special key to get in, in Kelly's office. You got to have a special key to get in a couple of these doors. But one key works most of them. Can't get into the utility room. Don't know why you can't get in there, but... There's keys that work for certain doors. There's certain keys, you're in possession of them, but they don't work in certain doors. 
So you got to get revelation from Jesus Christ, how it works. And he's telling you this. He says, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And he says, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So first thing you have to understand about this verse is Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You are not going to change God in any way. You can make him happy. You can please him. You can disappoint him. You can make God angry. But you're not going to change how the kingdom of God works. It works perfectly. You cannot add to perfection. He is perfect in all his ways. All his ways are perfect. The gospel of Jesus Christ is perfect. So when he says that whatever the keys of the kingdom of heaven, that whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven, that's telling you that's a Pharisee term. The Sadducees and the Pharisees used the term when you came into the synagogue, when you came into the house of God, if it was bound in the temple, it wasn't permitted. Jesus was basically saying, hey, this money changing, this money exchange, this is bound in the temple of God. This livestock exchange, this is bound in the temple of God. He was basically saying, hey, you've made my father's house a den of thieves. It was not permitted. Whatever was loosed in heaven is loosed on earth. And so... What was permitted was giving of alms and the worship and the prayers and the reading of the, of, of, of the law and the prophets. All these things, prof, all these things were, were loosed in the temple of God. So you have the authority now with these keys. The key is the knowledge of God's will. I want no man to perish, but every man come to the knowledge of Jesus and be saved. I give you the keys that if any man be in Christ, he, behold, he is a new creation. This thing started with me. This thing grows with me. This thing ends with me until you meet me face to face. These are the keys that you keep going. You're to have a heavenly perspective. You're to store up your riches, not on earth, but in heaven. And to have an understanding that, hey, if you build your, your anything outside of the rock, then you're building on sand. And when you build anything on sand, the devil has the legal right to come send a storm and to beat against the house and crash it down. And so a lot of times you've crashed in your life over and over again. Your ministries crashed. Relationships have crashed. Opportunities have crashed. Finances have crashed. You have to go back to the way God wants you to do it. These are the keys. He shows you God loves a cheerful giver. Do everything with prayers and supplications. The, the plans of many advisors, these plans will succeed. When you take things into your own mind and your own power, this is building upon the sand. These are, these are keys of the kingdom of heaven. And then you wonder why things keep going bad. You're, you live in a fornication. Well, we lo I loved Betty. We're, we're going to get me and Betty. We're, we're like married, but you're not married. So when you're having sex, you're living in fornication. You're doing it on a regular basis. You're living in sin. God has to chastise you. God has to discipline you because he loves you. So your joy has to crash at one point. It doesn't crash instantly because that's called mercy. And that's called grace. And his kindness is supposed to lead us to repentance. But when you have spirits, the spirits harden your heart. And they make you rebellious against God so that you fight. Why can't I do this? I love her. Hey, we've already done it a hundred times. What's, what's another hundred? I mean, before God's eyes, it's all sin. Hey, he died for me. His blood will cover this. No, now you're beginning to believe a lie. You're beginning to walk out the lie. And lie's manifestation is make you delusional. So God has to break these delusions in your mind and in your life by having it crash down. And people, why have you left me, Lord? Guy came in, I talked about him. He hasn't been back. He didn't like me one bit. He came in here and he goes, How come I can't feel God? And he I said, What kind of life you live? He goes, Well, I quit watching porn for two months. I said, How long you watch porn? 20 years. How often you do it? Once a year, once a month, once a week, once a day, once a day. And I said, How long did this last? About 12 years after I got saved. I said, For 12 years? God was that merciful, and he's blessed your finances. I, I could see he was blessed. He had an $80,000 truck, 100000 probably. And he goes, I don't care about money. I'm like, 
He was already confrontational. I wasn't talking about your money. I was trying to use that as an analogy. He's blessed your money. He probably is a tither, a giver, an offer of, of, of gifts to, to people in need. So there's a protection over what God gave him. But now this came crashing down. Why? Because he had 13 years. I couldn't believe the mercy. I said, this is incredible that you didn't go to the mental hospital before this. You don't know how many times he's been telling you and warning you. He goes, yeah, I know. I, I used to repent. I used to quit. But then Internet porn became so powerful, and it was a delusion. God has to tear down your delusions. This is the mercy of God for him to tear them down. He told Jeremiah, he says, you got to pull down. you got to root out. <laughs> you gotta, you got to tear down. you got to throw out. you, you got to get rid of stuff. And I said, this is what you got to do. And he says, okay. And he bowed his head like, kick it out of me. I'm like, wow, I wish I had one. I'd crack you with it. Bow. You know, it wasn't that good. I'd really let you have it. But I, that's not how it works. You have to understand this truth, and you have to hate your sin. If you don't hate it, then you haven't asked God to hate it. He'll, let, he'll help you. He would never ask you to do anything that he wouldn't give you Holy Spirit power to do. And he said, love what I love. And hate what I hate. If you can't love people and forgive people, you need to ask God. And you need to ask him to open your eyes about the incredible forgiveness he's given you and the mercy he's given you. And then you understand whatever he gave you, you were to freely give to others. And so I said, you have to understand this, and then you have to fight for it. Hey, you can use, he's put you in the mental hospital. He can, you, he, you went to your pastor, you told on yourself, that, hey, that's embarrassing. You told on your wife, hey, you, you, this sin is embarrassing. Use that as fuel to fight. If you know it's wrong, that's why you feel convicted. That's why you feel embarrassed. That's why your wife was disgusted. That's why your pastor was looking at you very confused with this lifestyle. Use that to fight. But he didn't have any fight in him. So I said, hey, here, here's, here's some Bible verses. We got some sheets, some homework sheets to get you going with deliverance. And we said, hey, you can take these home. You can put them into action. You can be back here on Thursday, and you can be delivered. Oh, man, I'm going camping this weekend. Literally, that's what he said. I said, man, I don't know. You know, hey, I'm going to tell you what to do, but your family knows what's going on. They know how serious it is. I, I think... I said, well, if you don't make it this week, come the next week. I tried to be happy, like, hey, you'll get delivered. If you want to be delivered, you'll be delivered. Be back here. Never saw him again. And then the, then the spirits are so smart. You got to be able to catch them. I came from work. I was getting a little tired. It was an hour into it. I put my feet up on the desk. He goes, man, I don't like your, pa your, your posture. I don't like the way you're sitting. I don't like the way you're talking to me. I said, sir, you're on my time. I said, I came down here out of the kindness of my heart. I said, what is it that you do? He said, I work on boilers. And I said, well, when someone hires you to be a boiler, they got your undivided attention because they're about to cut you the check and what you, 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 you demand for your services. I'm doing this freely, so I'm going to do it as, the, as a way that uh, feels best at this point to be patient to keep working with you because you're not getting this. And that what it was was a fault-finding spirit that was looking for any way to get out. I don't like the way you're putting your feet on the desk. I, I don't like your posture. I mean, I'm sure it went on and on. He was probably afraid of the other things to say them to me, the things that I did that offended him. But the reality is the devil will always try to make you offended at somebody. He wants you offended at the church. He wants you offended at your family. He wants you offended with yourself and disgusted with yourself. And then what happens? There's no way out because you have given place to the devil repetitively, repetitively. And he will just repeat the same assassination. He will send you another lie and another lie for you to get offended. He will send you another circumstance to get offended. But you have to overcome. Now, there's people, you know, you got to get away from because they're not going to, they're going to keep offending and they're going to keep living in a way that hurts you or takes from you or diminishes the value of what you're trying to give them. You got to move on. You, you got to make some decisions. Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring division, even division of your own household for his name's sake. So these keys are, hey, whatever you bind on earth, 
hey, I don't want that. I don't want these negative thoughts. I don't want this witchcraft. I don't want this lust. I don't want this poor self-worth. I don't want to be envious and jealous. I don't want to have hate in my heart. This is bound. I do not permit this in my mind. And then what do you do? Hey, I'm saved by grace. I need to stand in the starting block until the Holy Spirit takes me off. How do I take off? Well, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God only. So I better put him first. Before I log on and watch TikTok or Instagram, I better be in the word. Before I get to my job and the eight hours of demands it's going to require, I better get in the word of God. I better get in prayer. I better put him first if I want him to do something. You putting him in your back pocket didn't do so well. You putting him when it was fitting in your lifestyle didn't do you so well. So you better make a change. And then what happens is, is God will begin to lead and guide you. So that's binding and loosing. And, you know, it would be nice if I could just bind Satan. Man, he's given me the keys of the kingdom of heaven. He's given me all power and all authority over the devil so I could just Bind them all, and there'd be no more demons. I mean, if that's true, if all meant all, then I could say, hey, Satan, you're bound over America. Hey, those devils over the White House. Uh, hey, you want to find something? This is a side note. I'm not going to get too political, I promise myself. But go watch when these senators and these congressmen, go watch when they're speaking and doing their little investigations, and they're talking to Mark Zuckerberg, and they're talking to Elon Musk. Go look at the people behind them. Go look how strange they look and the mannerisms and the things they're doing with their eyes. Who are these people? And, and what are they doing? It's very, very odd. But if I had the authority, like some believe, then I could bind all those devils. And if there was no devils, hey, most people, they would still sin, but they would say, hey, man, we're playing with World War III we can't bomb three nations in one week. Hey, we can't fund endless wars out of money that we're just creating, and the only thing that backs it up is military power. Hey, we got to stop doing this. we got to build strong families. Hey, we can't force feed people to believe this woke agenda stuff. This is asinine. This is an assault on good people with morals. Hey, let's stop all this if I had the authority to do it. But I don't have that authority. If we were to be binding in the heavenlies or binding over Maricopa County or over Phoenix or over the nation or over the world, over the continents, then you would have saw one example. You would have saw one example from a disciple or Jesus himself. But he said, pray for Jerusalem and that we're to pray for our enemies and we're to pray for those that spitefully use us. And we're supposed to pray for those people that, that wish us ill. We're not to create or, or to give reviling for reviling, but we were to operate in prayer and in faith. And then God does this business up here. Nowhere in scriptures do we see anyone calling on angels. If any minister you're watching is working with angels and he's commanding them what to do and they're doing things in the audience, you, you get up out of there and you run. You get off that channel, I don't care what kind of manifestations you've seen, gold dust, people flop around, people jumping for joy, saying they were 100% delivered in one prayer. I don't care what you think you saw. Turn the channel because that's dangerous. Not one time. Now, Jesus says, hey, I came to give my life. No one's taken my life as a ransom. Don't you understand? I could call legions upon legions of angels to come down and wipe everybody out. I got all power and authority, but I didn't come to be served. I came to serve and to lay down my life as a ransom. I'm going to finish the task in which I came for. And he finishes it. Jesus says on the cross, it is finished. At the cross of Calvary, he defeats the devil. He was the first innocent man that the devil ever killed when Satan killed every other man, he had the authority to kill him because the law was when you sin, the wages of sin is death. He had the authority to kill him. But now he killed the sinless son of God. And Jesus goes down and he takes the keys of, of heaven, I mean of hell and Hades. He's got the keys. All judgment is given to the son. The son is the judge. He's the one that we give an account to. He gives us power over the devil. Why? He has the ability to do it because he created the devil. Then he defeated the devil for us in the realm in which he created us to live in humanity. So now you have to operate 
in a biblical way. You can't do extra biblical things. Calling on angels. Oh, hey, do you feel that? I saw some YouTube guy. You feel that? That's an angel. You work with angels. He cries. Uh, those fallen angels or those demons, they got power. They can make you cry. Have you not seen Kundalini people over in India pressing themselves up, doing these poses to these different gods for hours on end all their life? They, they have all kinds of euphoric feelings. They have all kinds of weird manifestations that they believe is God. He's doing something to the central nervous system. He's doing something in the brain to release dopamine and pleasures that would make them believe that this is real and this is good. He's a masterful deceiver. So God does everything decently in order. What he wants you to do, you're supposed to loose that in your life. What you're not supposed to do, it's clearly depicted in the Bible, that is supposed to be bound in your life. And when it's bound in your life on earth, then the power of God, the Holy Spirit, or if he sends angels, that's his business. He does most of his stuff through the Holy Spirit, but I'm sure he uses angels. Then he goes to implement what you loosed. You loose that word, and then you go and you bind something. He gives you the supernatural power. He'll drive the enemy back from you. That's why we intercede for these children. We should be praying for these kids. These kids are going to be the most messed up kids ever because of these masks. Sit here with boogers on your face. Do it. Hey, raise your mask. Raise that. Put up your over your nose, Timmy. I mean, this was a psychological warfare to destroy kids. Don't get away. You're too close. You're too close. Little kids are supposed to be hugged and love people and play, play with people and play in dirt and play with rocks and interact with people and understand things. And they shut it all down. I, I tend to believe that's probably going to be the generation that, that sees the Antichrist and sees him come over because they're going to be so desensitized to love and to understanding. And then they couldn't read. You understand everything by facial expression. Stop doing that. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You don't know if they're mad. It's just the word. When I used to see teachers, man, they'd start, I said, oh, man, I got to be quiet. This is it. This is it. There's no more playing around. I'm going to be out of this school. I'm going to be crowded. My motorcycle is going to get taken away. I'm going to be back to riding my bicycle. I knew what those facial expressions meant in the third, fourth, fifth grade. And you learn to heed and understand people, and, and you learn to be quiet when it's time to be quiet. You learn through facial expressions it was okay to speak. They, you couldn't see it. Oh, it, was some, it was a psychological warfare for future generations. To me, it didn't do anything but say, aha, yeah, these people are truly nuts, and now they're showing how nuts they are, and I hope everybody realizes in whom they used to trust is full nuts, and it's led by a bunch of nuts. Well, that proved itself to me, but some people didn't have that experience. They didn't have those years. They were kids. They were infants. It's going to play a role. They're not going to understand. You, you need to have, and then correlating it with us, with, with Christians, you need to have sensitivity of the Holy Spirit. Man, I realize when I'm starting to talk a little bit too much of the past, and I, the Holy Spirit's not, ah, kind of, there's a little bit of tug on your heart. No, nah, let's, let's wrangle that back into something positive. No one's going to be blessed if that story is told from that perspective and what you used to think when that happened. Let's, let's wrangle that back. Sometimes uh, I leave here and I say, oh, man, I was a little too hard. Oh, man, I let a little too much uh, political stuff go. Most people can't digest that. I need to be considerate of all people and where they are and how they've been trained. It's hard if you were a little kid in black and white TV watching the first man go to the moon when I tell you that we never went to the moon. So I got to be more considerate of those people. And I get a little nudge from the Holy Spirit. Don't do that again. Come on, let's stay focused on things. But what happens is when you got spirits, there's no sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. You just start running and saying whatever you want to say. And when you start running and saying whatever you say, you get into trouble. You start fires. You start quarrels. You're not sensitive. You get this little stance, and now you got to fight back. And someone wants to bring correction, and now I'm not taking correction. Now you need and kind of want correction over here, but you're already fighting, and you're resisting everything. And that's what James talks about this. He says, brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that you'll be you'll receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he's a perfect man. He's able to bridle his whole body. Indeed, we put 
bits into horses' mouths that they may obey us and we may turn the whole body. Look at the ships, although they're so large and they're driven by fierce winds, they're turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. And even so, the tongue is a little member and it boasts of great things. You see how great a little forest fire is kindled, kindled, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members, and it defiles the whole body, and it sets on fire the course of the nature, and it is set on fire by hell. Ooh. So what's the devil want to do? He wants you just to take off saying whatever you want to say. And how does he get you to do that? Most of the time, it has to do with lies. You're either believing lies or you're lying. And then you override your conscience. I remember I told the last lie, I can remember saying it. He says, hey, man. He said, Rick, can you dunk a basketball? I said, yeah, I could dunk a basketball. And then, uh, then he says, how old were you? I said, I was 15. I was like, man, later I was like, that was a lie. I could only dunk a volleyball. I couldn't get the full grip on the basketball. Why did I have to do that? What was that for? So if you don't heed the convictions of telling lies, because lies will pop out of you. Sometimes they're self-justified. Maybe you've said the story before and it was a lie. It just comes out. But if you don't heed the Holy Spirit, then you're overriding the conviction and you're on your own. And now the tongue is just running. It's steering you. It's just a little member, but it's steering and navigating your life. It's a little spark and boom, it's catching things on fire right and left. So you have to go back to the basics is you got to have a conviction of the Holy Spirit. If you have conviction of the Holy Spirit, then you can control your tongue. But the manifestation of your tongue just saying any old thing and fighting and quarreling and telling stories and exaggerating things, these are all done by a, by a spiritual influence that's got you to push back your conscience. I work with the, this guy and his conscience is gone. He's born again. And uh, he wants to open a medical marijuana facility. Man, that's, you'd be a part. You'd have so much blood on your hands, man. You'd get demons like you, you, you have no idea. You're going to give schizophrenia to people. You're going to put fear in people. And it's gonna, it takes all the ambitions. You have, oh, why do you think they're letting in the third world to come and do the work that the pot-smoking, porn-watching kids can't do? They can't do it. They're too lazy. They're too drunk with the seductions of this world. They're looking for the easy hustle. They're looking for cryptocurrency millions. But they got to have someone that can put the boots on the ground and work by the sweat of their brow to get this thing done. So they got to go around the world to get them. Because this generation got lost with the seductions of sin. And here he is wanting to promote that, and he's born again. I'm saying, man, you got to let that go, man. You got to... You got a contractor license. You 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 speak fluent Spanish. I mean, you got to take advantage of this, man. You 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 got a good eye for detail. You know how to do basically every trade. You need to work this. This is what God gave you. This is your blessing. But he can't maximize the blessing because the blessing is being infiltrated with a satanic delusion. He's doing that bookstore right there. And I said, look, man. Why do why, why you want to keep juicing up these prices, bro? This is the house of God. His wife got delivered at the old building. And thank God he got rid of whatever spirit she had. She ain't living with them no more. You know this is the house of God. I said, you walk in, you can have a nice business card right on there. People want a kitchen. That basically a bookstore is going to be like a new kitchen and the quarry on tops. I said, come on, man. You got to give a blessing. And he's just sticking to the book. Well, no, my worker's charging this amount, and I got to put on 25%. I'm like, okay, he can't see the vision. He can't see the vision. Not to say there might not be a blessing down the road, or that might be a, but I'm telling you, the Lord, if you try the Lord, he says he'll open up the windows of heaven because what? That's a key, and he will pour you out a blessing. He'll give you favor with man. He'll give you favor with him. But that's got to be loosed in your life to see that vision, to make a, an offering, to give something to God, uh, despite of, hey, yeah, that's normally what I get paid. I need that kind of money. I got bills. But you're seeing the vision of God. Hey, that's going to allow somebody. I told him about my friend Lori. I said, Lori is the bookstore minister. I said, she's got twofold ministry, and, and one is to keep people from running out of here. And so he's got a nice, calm demeanor and say, hey, can I, hold on a minute. Can I talk to you? 
and, and, and sometimes they got a message and they come back. Sometimes they, she gets them to come back in the, in the uh, service. Sometimes she leaves them with scriptures. Then you're, you're growing in godliness. She knows all the books in there to keep you edified. I said, man, that's a, that's a resource center. You could, you could give into something that would bless people. Oh, man. Like I'm hustling them now. Oh, you're always hustling. There's an the old ticket hustle in you trying to get us to give some of that. Uh, but some people don't understand the keys. I'm not mad at the guy. He's a nice guy. He's an honest guy. I mean, he's, anything he charges is in the contracts, so there's no problem. But what I'm trying to tell you is there's keys of the kingdom of heaven. Sinners don't have the keys of the kingdom of heaven. They can't see them. They're spiritually discerned. They have no spiritual discernment because they're spiritually dead. The minute you're born again, your spirit man is alive. And Christ is now dwelling with you. And he says, I will now manifest myself to them. You will see the manifestation of having the keys of the kingdom of heaven opening doors that no man can open. You'll see the power. Power as you have the keys to shut a door that no man can shut. Lord, help me. I'm tired of this. I'm tired of sinning. I'm tired of backsliding. I'm tired of busted relationships. If I got to be single all my life, it is what it is. I'm going to trust you, but I cannot live in fornication. I cannot be unequally yoked again with a non-believer. I cannot do it. And God gives you the power according to your will, and he shuts it. I don't know. He could have angels walking beside you to shut that down. He could just have Holy Spirit power that just went, whoo, and the devil knows you can't cross that line. I don't know how he does it. I just know he does it. And he does it according to what you want. When you want something that's in God's will, he'll do it. He's not a respecter of persons. But why you can't have your breakthrough is because you have to be faithful. You have to have some action. You have to get rid of some doubt, unbelief, some fear, some confusion, some rejection. There's something that you have to cut off so that you can move forward. Cut off the sin that so easily entangles that you could run the race to win the prize. That's the move according to what God called you to do. Verse 13, who is wise and understanding among you? So he says, if you're wise and if you're understanding, he said, let him show it by his good conduct, that his works are done in meekness and wisdom. Boy, that that excludes about 50% of YouTube ministers. It says meekness and wisdom. Then it goes on, he says, but if you're bitter, if you have bitter envy, you're self-seeking, So a bitter, envious person, he's neck deep in sin. Self-seeking, he's just deceived. He can think he's doing it for God. He can think he's doing it on the right path. He says, you're deceived in your hearts. And do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom doesn't descend from above, but it's first earthly. That's what you saw. That's how many people operate. And then it's sensual because you saw it. It appealed to your flesh. It was fleshly, and ultimately, it is demonic. It's from demons. The devil deceives the whole world. The whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. Man, the biggest sway you ever see, there's two big sways that you see in people. Going from junior high to high school, man, I saw people just change. I saw this one kid, I'd say his name, but maybe I get blessed and he watches me on YouTube. But man, he was, he was my friend. But it was okay. We're a little dorky, and we don't have the coolest clothes and the five pair of sneakers. We were the guys that got one at the beginning of the season and another another pair uh, for Christmas. And, man, he just became Mr. Cool Kid. Man, he had a different walk to him. I mean, his chest was out a little more, and he cut off all his friends that wouldn't make him popular. I said, well, that's, that's odd. I said, man, these guys, we loved you for who you were. You had friends. Well, we weren't good enough friends. And then when you see women, oh, women, girls that were pure sexually, had never had any sexual encounters, and then they go to college. Then they have a handful of lovers in one semester. Like, ooh, I don't know if that's why. There's no longer wifey material for me. He done taken a road of no return in my mind, but hey, it was something that just got open. It was a door that got open. Why? It was socially acceptable. 
Oh, it was now the blind leading the blind, the, the, the sophomores and the juniors, the people who had been at it for a while, the seniors. They lived in this lifestyle. So where did this type of wisdom come? It was walking around on the earth. It was happening. It was socially acceptable. It wasn't socially acceptable in Nebraska in 1980s. That was not a good reputation. And I didn't know any girl in high school that had a bad reputation from having five lovers. I didn't know one. Because people had a sense of morality and right from wrong, and they were, they were able to hold on because that's the way basically that high school ran. But then you went to college, and it ran differently, and it ran sensual. And since it was operating on this earth and it appealed to their sensuality, they opened that door, walked in it, and it was demonic. And it was demonic. And you go, those, you can look at the statistics. When you've had sex, a woman with over 10 men, they go through divorces, like thumbing through them. Why? Because when you bond with a human being, and even if you, you don't love them, you're, you're coming together. The two come together. Paul said, should I unite with, my har with a harlot? He said, certainly not, because he who's joined with a harlot is one in spirit. Oh, there's a spiritual connection. So then there's a spiritual deposit. There's a spiritual depletion. And pretty soon, hey, those relationships come with a lot of disappointments, a lot of lies, a lot of betrayal, a lot of heartbreaks, a lot of failure. And so a part gets broken off. The lack of trust, the lack of empathy, the lack of compassion, it gets rooted out. And so now you finally find someone you love and you find people, I just can't trust my husband. Well, why can't you trust your husband? Does he watch porn? No, I've never seen him watch porn. Why can't you trust him? Is he on dating sites? No, I've never seen him on that. Why does he flirt with women? Does he smile at women? Do they flirt? By? No, I've never seen him do any of that. I just can't trust him. No, it's you can't trust because a part of you was ripped out and that demonic spirit is telling you the problem is your husband. Ah, oh, when he's not what you're accusing him of and you admit it with your own words and the own testimony of the life that you live together it's a blame shifting spirit causing division trying to start fires trying to drive things away so when you pick up spirits they're going to have a negative repercussion that's how it works you don't just say hey i'm slept with a hundred chicks i'm good hey i'm looking for someone in the church no you got to gut out root out pull down tear out and throw out those spirits you picked up. Because 100% you picked up numerous hundreds of spirits, if not thousands, sleeping with all those women. And from my experience, it gets to be about the number 20 to the number 50, and a man gets a witch. And, uh, you know, I'm not trying to be hard on women, but women are prone to witchcraft. There is far more witches than there are warlocks. Those are facts. And... And those women still are beautiful, and they're still kind, and they still have a lot of the lovely attributes, but they have familiar spirits. They have dark spirits that are looking to destroy men. And they transfer right into men, and when a Christian, especially a minister, sleeps with a, with a witch, he often loses his mind. We've seen numerous people come through here. I, one of the guys that's still to this date, one guy, 12 years ago, first day, casting out devils, ripped this place up. You would have thought we, we, we flew in some vet deliverance minister from North Carolina. I mean, he tore this place up. I mean, he was on these demons, and they were flying out. And then he slept with a witch. And it took a few other women that he was sleeping with before Satan had the authority to send him a witch. But down that road, and he had already lived with that lifestyle of those dozens upon dozens of lovers, and then goes back to the old sin, something nastier is waiting down, uh, down that road. Because what's happening, you're burning up grace, you're burning up mercy, and so God has to get your attention. So, hey, that's a long fight. The Bible says he who's been sick in his body is done with sin. Oh, because he prayed... The congregation prayed, and they didn't have surgeries like they have now and organ transplants and 
eight billion medications, man, you needed God to come through. And when God came through and you were close to death because you could die of many, many diseases back in those days, he said, when you've been through something like that, and you've wrestled through that, you are done with sin. He's speaking a matter of fact. So when someone comes through a fornication and they get super sick like that, if they make it out, they're done with it. But some don't make it out. Some don't make it out. You, they played, they, they went up the food chain with something dark. I remember he was calling me. And uh, he would call me with these strange manifestations, you, you know, and say the, I mean, these stories are unbelievable. I mean, if I took, I, I, I could write a book about this guy in, in one year of, of dealing with them. And uh, he goes, yeah, man, this girl in my apartment, but I found out she's a witch, and man, you know, She's going to have her coven leader call me. So I said, yeah, I want to talk to her. I was going to shape her up with the Bible. And, dude, you won't believe it. They believe everything we believe. I said, oh, no, 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 no. They incorporate everything you say they believe. It's not what they, the, what they believe is the problem. It's what they do. They believe that. They believe this. And therefore, they do that. And I said, that is what you need to be looking at. A good tree does not bear bad fruit, and a bad tree does not bear good fruit. Thus, by the fruits they produce, you shall know them. And he didn't heed the warning and got together with her. Oh, he came back to haunt me. He burnt my building down. Thank God the firemen got there, and I only had to buy a new $500 door when they busted the door down and, and about... $5,000 with a soot damage and all kinds of, I was hiring jail inmates for months to come and just mop the soot off the roof and the walls. But, hey, this life ain't easy. And when people that you love and people you invest in and people that you see that have incredible gifts from God go and piss it all down the drain and go to the dark side, it, it's, it's, it's a heartbreaker. But you got to keep going. You got to keep going. You got to look for the next one. And Jesus said to the disciples, hey, you got to kick that dust off your feet. You got to let it go. And then you got to go look for the, for the next person with the same attitude as when you found that person and they were doing well. But what happens is the devil hardens people's hearts. So my buddy, when he was telling me, going back to him, the guy who lived in constant fornication, he said, uh, hey, um, you know, the, these are hard. No one listens. And you know what? Over time, you stop doing it. You stop preaching. You stop sharing. You stop expecting. You stop living for the Lord and advancing the kingdom. That's what the devil wants you to do. He wants you to stop. He wants you to quit. But the reality is we don't quit. We got to regroup. We got to regroup and we got to stand on the word. And then we got to walk it out. Hey, it's hard. I, I remember one time the Holy Spirit fell on me. And this guy was an incredible preacher from Jamaica, man. He was on another, he was a, he was a beachy. That, that's like somewhere in between a Mennonite and Amish. His beard, he only grew it on his neck, one of those guys. He had the, but man, he had power and he had authority of the Holy Spirit. And he believed every word in that scripture. And I got a touch from God and I, used to sell sculptures, sports sculptures, and I sold them to the Suns. I sold them to all these pro athletes and, and uh, sports bars. And God told me it was idolatry. And I, threw, I started throwing them out. And I started throwing them out of my house. And I, first I started setting them gently. Then I started throwing $4,500 sculptures. Sold one to Eric Swan, six-time Pro Bowl guy. He got kicked. Hey, thanks, appreciate it. He got kicked out of the or he got uh, cut from the NFL. He didn't come and get the rest of it. I threw his in the trash. He had a three-year window to get our, maybe it was a little less time at that one. I threw it in the trash. I tossed all this. But then the next day, and I had all this adrenaline. I had all this excitement. God was with me because then I went in. I was about to throw all my kids' little toys away. They had little he-men and all that. And the Lord, I heard his voice. This is enough for today. This is enough. So he was going to teach me discernment. But I woke up the next day, and I was myself. And I'm like, but now the money that I was going to get, the money I invest, that was gone. And I said, hey, I can't look back. I can't look out there. 
I can't go back and get that. I, I got to draw the line in the sand, and I got to move forward. I got to just take one day at a time. That's all, that's all I can do. Hey, when you're out of shape and you show up to sports, there's nothing you can do. You can't cry. You can't kick and fight. You just got to press through, and eventually your body will kick into condition, and I realized I got to just keep moving forward. And so Proverbs chapter 20, 21, he says, where there is no wood, the fire goes out. Give no place to the devil. You won't burn with lust. It'll go out. You got envy. You got hate. Don't put any wood on it. That thing will go out. He says, and where there is no tail bearer, strife ceases. Stop telling lies to yourself. You're not good enough. You're not loved. God doesn't care. There's no mercy for you. It's too late. You got to stop lying to yourself, and the strife will cease. As charcoal is to burning coals, as wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. So we're not going to do that. That's what we're not going to do. That's going to be bound in your life from this point on. We all know Ephesians 6. And uh, is the go-to in in uh, in deliverance. So the principalities, the powers, the rulers of darkness, the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly realms, what they're doing, their first plan of attack. You can see it when Jesus is inter interacting with Satan in the wilderness, and he comes to him and he says, "If you be the Son of God, well, he knows who he is." He knows that all the demons knew. They started throwing a fit when he would show up in the temples. And they said, well, what do you, we know who you are, the son of God. What have you come to do, torment us before the appointed time? He, Satan knew who he was, but he does what he does. So Jesus is telling on him, if you be the son of God, tell the stone to be bread. Hey, you're the son of God. Throw yourself down. God will pick you up. At least you dash your foot on a stone. Hey, I'll tell you what, you don't need to die for the people. Bow your knee, I'll give them to you. So Jesus was loosing the word of God. It is written, man shall not live off bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. It is written, you shall serve no other gods, but serve God alone. So he's standing on the word of God. He's loosing it. He's binding the devil by definition of loosing the word of God. He doesn't have to say, hey, I rebuke you, shut your mouth, you're an offense to me, I hate your guts. No, how he, how he binds him is by loosing the word of God. And that advances him. That he moves right out of there. Then the holy angels come and comfort him, and he restores himself, and he fulfills his ministry with signs, wonders, and miracles. But in order to move in that miraculous power over Satan, he first had to have a showdown with Satan. You have to have a showdown with Satan where you're going to stand on the word of God. You're going to reject his lies. You're going to keep going even though it's hard, even though you don't understand. You're going to learn how to operate by your spirit man and not by your flesh man. You're going to renew your mind according to the word of God. And then as you advance, oh, the devil's, now he's grasping from behind. You can... It's hard for him to grab you from behind. But hey, if you're navigating, getting pulled left and right into sin and temptations, you're going to continually run into him. If you can't control your tongue, you're going to continually run into him. If you can't take your thoughts captive, you're going to continually run into him. So once Satan works with the principalities and the powers and all these forces, their goal, the first thing they do is they're working with the wiles, the lies, if you be the son of God. Did God really say you shouldn't eat this fruit? Oh, surely you won't die. That's his power. By the time he's moving you around and kundalini in you around and gyrating you and getting you doing money dances and money coming and sowing seeds to get a hundredfold blessing back, he riddled you with lies. You were buckshot over and over and over with lies for you to walk out and believe those deceptions. So... He's going to come with all this doubt. Those are the wiles. And if you don't identify his voice, you, you can't beat the devil. But the devil sounds like you. He's a masterful deceiver. He sounds like someone who cussed you out. And that voice from your harsh father, Rick, what are you doing? My dad used to clench his teeth. 
bang, hit stuff right, all the time. And, uh, well, if I would let that shock me, you know, oh, man, I'm no good. I always make everybody mad. Well, I did have a track record of cracking people. I used to, I, I've cracked a few teachers, and I thought it was fun, you know, just to poke and poke and poke and disrupt the class until they would explode. And, uh, well, then they'd go crazy, and, and they'd yell, and then I'd be in the doghouse, then, I, then I'd be in special ed in this class, and, and I already heard every time I went in there when I first went, hey, you're stupid. You're a retard being in there. I would hear it over and over again. Well, if I went back, and every time I'm trying to do something new or trying to operate as a, as a man of God or minister the word of God or help somebody, if I listened to that voice, that voice would have the legal right to come at me over and over again because I gave place to the voice, which is demonic. So I forget the things which are behind. I'm not trying to antagonize people. I'm not trying to ruin my opportunity in school anymore, in education. I'm trying to excel. I'm trying to grow. So I'm forgetting what's behind. Mercy and grace has covered those sins. I've confessed them. And now I'm being shaped and molded by the hand of God himself into the image of Jesus day by day through his mercy and by his grace. So you got to move on. And so the wiles of the devil, the door has to be shut. My sheep know my voice, and the voice of another they will not follow. It's not the distinction. I know my wife's voice, my daughter's voice, my son's voice. I'm not confused. Although I am a little bit now. My daughter's getting older. She sounds a little like my wife on the phone when I'm on speakerphone. And I've called her my wife before. And, hey, when are you coming home? I'm at school. What are you talking about? So... It's not the tone of the voice. It's not the sound of the voice. It's what the voice is saying. You have to understand the accuser. You have to understand the enticer. You have to understand the enemy that's trying to twist the word of God. And then you understand God's word because you're in God's word. And the Holy Spirit comes to quicken your mind, to teach you and remind you of everything that he spoke. And you're starting to operate in the power of God. You're beginning to walk in victory. And then you can see when there's something demonic. They will, they will make some moves. And you'll go, man, I need some deliverance. He really tried that? Man, I even felt a tug in my mind. Man, that, that lie seemed believable for a second. That's a demonic spirit. I got to get that thing out of there. He'll tell on himself. But if you haven't drawn the line in the sand to bind and to loose, to stand on the truth and advance, then you'll never really recognize him. He'll continually just to pillage and pick at you piece by piece, day by day, little by little, until he erodes your life, takes away your Christian destiny, and, uh, and that would be very sad. The wiles of the devil, his goal is to come in and have a place. A place. Now he's operating from the inside. It says, give no place to the devil. Once he goes through the wiles and gets a place, now he gets a hold. Now you'll find yourself being, hey, I said I wasn't going to drink. I, I said I wasn't going to watch porn. And then pretty soon, if you don't stop him at the hold, he gets a stronghold. And now you don't want to do something. And man, why did I do this? I had no plans to do that. And you're doing it. That's the stronghold. You don't stop him there. He's going to bring you down into oppression. Oppression is very sad. That's where most people get broke because you see the blessings. They're coming to your friends. They're coming to your family. They're coming to your coworkers. And you're praying for them. You're reaching out. But they always just keep coming by you. If you don't stop him when you're oppressed, he'll push you down to another level. And he will bring you into or oppression. Then he'll bring you down to depression. A depressed person doesn't even reach out anymore. They're not even making moves for God anymore. They're just, they're just complacent with the beating. If you don't stop them at depression, the ultimate goal is deception. And at that point, no one can help you because you're deceived. You don't know truth from a lie. You can't tell the difference anymore. So the devil, it takes him a while to bring someone down to that level. And when you add in witchcraft and you add in sexual immorality, high-level sin, you, you add in drugs and drunkenness, he's able to deceive you under the influence of that drugs fast. That's why you have to be sober and in control. But systematically without drugs, alcohol, and witchcraft, then it's a systematically decline. And then when you go to church, most of those men, I mean, you can't tell by looking at them. They're just going there. They got good families. The, most men in their 60s got a million dollars in the bank that are at Baptist churches. They saved their money. They weren't squandering them on 
prostitutes and lascivious living and gambling. And so they're, they got all that. Their 401K is fat. When they retire, they don't, there's no need to, to work. Uh, you're set. Well, there's a sense of pride and arrogance that comes along. And they're well respected in the church. And because you give money, hey, they, they know who you are. And it depends on the church. Sometimes they don't. But the reality is they trust in their righteousness. That's a complete deception when you trust in your own righteousness. When you do things and you read the word of God and you're not doing those things and there's no conviction and you have nothing to fight for, you are a deceived person. And he has deceived many Christians, and they just go through the church motionless. They don't do anything. They sing songs. Hey, they write checks to that church. Hey, they send their kids to the Bible camp. Hey, they, they even send their kids to pastor's college. It's a nice, noble thing if you could be a preacher as, as one of their sons. But there's so many people, they're dead. They're dead spiritually. They're no longer trying to win souls. They bought into the conformity of this world. This world says, don't be preaching at work. Oh, you can't do that here. Oh, that's not dignified to get down on the streets, the highways and byways, and get to preaching. Hey, that could be offensive doing it at the gym or the grocery store. Oh, they've been conformed into submission, and that's a dangerous place. Oh, that is a dangerous place to be in, to be deceived. But even deceived people, God will breathe on you truth, and you can make a move. Mercy will come for you, and if you'll reach out for it, and you'll receive it, and you'll fight for it. Hey, you, you can be forgiven. Anybody that will stand on the word of God can be forgiven. Anybody that will turn his back on the devil, uh, God will help you. Anybody who wants to use the keys of the kingdom of heaven can do it. Anybody who wants to build himself on Jesus Christ and his truth, he can do it because God's for you. But now we have to, we got to, Pull down and root out. How do you pull down and root out the devil? It's by forgiving yourself and forgiving other people. That's the number one offense. I'm going to look you all dead in the face. And someone's going to be on this altar call, most likely, and they're going to be blocked from getting deliverance. And they're not going to know why. And the minister's going to come up to you and they're going to say, who do you need to forgive? And you go, ah, oh, you know, I, I've forgiven everyone. I don't know. No, that's called lip service forgiving. Jesus didn't tell you to do the lip service. He said, if you forgive from your heart, it's a, it's a, it's a heart issue. Why? That's why you didn't forgive them and you took an offense because they did something wrong. They said something negative. There was some betrayal. There was something evil that happened. That's why it was the offense. And you had time and you had mercy to take care of it. Or like me and how I ended up in here 14 years ago is I would forgive from my heart and then I would take it back when things wouldn't go my way. And I would give it away again. I'd feel convicted. Then I would take it back because he should do something right. Now I hear you're prospering. You should pay it back. And then I would give it again. And then finally it became lip service. Uh, you would have asked me, hey, have you forgiven everyone? I would have said 100% I forgive people. I know not to take an offense. I teach on that. I was deceived, and I kept taking it back. That's what my heart was crying out to be served. The flesh was crying out to be served. Hey, I want what's right. I want to be justified. You owe me some money. You owe me an apology. You owe me a tear. You owe me something. And something isn't going to come because God's trying to tell you this is a spiritual issue, and you have given place to the devil. So you need to understand in order to forgive what God did for you. Peter was a certified knucklehead. And you got to give it to the guy. I mean, he's got some knucklehead faith. He pulls out his sword. You got a bunch of thugs. I mean, these guys were the cops, military, all in one. There was 1% Roman soldiers to 99% civilians. So when you got to going, hey, what, what's the one you always see on YouTube? Uh, what's your right for pulling me over? You know, what, 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 am I being charged with a crime? At, at that point, a batarang came out and bam, cracked your skull. I mean, these dudes were rough. They, they nailed thieves on each side of Jesus to the right and left. 
And Peter pulls out his sword, and he tries to cut this dude's head right in two, misses and cuts his ear off. Malchus. So he's got all kinds of fire. I'll never deny you, Lord. Denies him the third time with cursing. So he had all kinds of fire, but he had something in him. He had something in him that had to go. And once he got the Holy Spirit, he was saved. You know, Peter was saved at this time. They marveled when they went out and the demons were subjected to him. They came back and they told Jesus all the stories of casting out demons. He said, don't marvel at the fact that demons are subjected to you in my name. Marvel at the fact your names are written in the book of life. His name was written in the book of life, so that means you're saved. But he had all this stuff in him. It's not till the Holy Spirit comes down on him in Acts chapter 2 and fills him up. And he does something, and he preaches a message under the power of the Holy Spirit and leads thousands of people to Jesus in one sermon. So the Holy Spirit brings the power. He brings the power of God's word. When you believe God's word, when you stand on God's word, the Holy Spirit, it'll resound in your heart. It'll, he'll write it in your mind. It's powerful. It's life-changing if you believe it is, if you want it to be. But a lot of people, they want to keep God at the distance where you can, I don't want to do this. I don't want to be over the top person. I don't want to be committed. I need my 401K. I don't want to be too committed. I got hobbies. And so they willfully reject and resist the Holy Spirit. You got to repent of that. And you got to repent of not forgiving people from your heart. You need to repent of not forgiving yourself from your heart. And if you do that, God will take all your sins and have the blood of Jesus applied, and it will wash them into the sea of forgetfulness. He will count them against you no more. If he counts them against you no more, and you confess them, that means you, you wanted God to forgive you of them. You were turning your back on them. Now you know when the devil starts speaking any of those things which have already been paid for, it's him. That's your first key to deliverance, you got to understand who he is and what he's saying and what's already happened between you and God so you can make your stand on the truth. I'll show you how to do it. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the revelation of Jesus Christ, your only begotten Son, in whom you sent approximately 2,000 years ago to be born of the Virgin and who lived a sinless life we have a merciful and a faithful high priest that was tempted in every way that man can be tempted, but with no sin. He was the sinless son of God. Thank you, Jesus, for laying down your life as a ransom on that cross of Calvary. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for pouring out your blood upon the earth for the remission of my sins. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you, Lord, that you defeated the devil. Thank you, Lord that you rose Jesus from the dead on that third day. Oh, what a reminder. What a glorious reminder that one day we will rise from the dead. If we're alive, when you come back for the second time, oh, well, the dead will rise first, and then we'll be caught up in the sky to be greeted with them, and then we'll go on to be with you forever. Lord, that is the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're so grateful that our names are written in the book of life because we believe, Lord. We believe, and Lord, we want to serve you, Lord. We don't want to just be going through the motions. Going through the motions got me sick. Going through the motions got me depressed. Going through the motions gave place to the devil, Lord, and I, I want to tell you that I'm sorry. I, I didn't put you first in all areas, Lord. Please forgive me of not doing that, Lord. And I'm telling you, I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry for being so lustful. I'm, I've, I've been... Living with these spirits for so long, they almost had me convinced I'm just a lustful, over-sexual person. But I know that's a lie. I know that you give me Holy Spirit power to bring my body into subjection, that my body would be under my control. But no demon's going to be in control. He's got to be cast out. Demonic spiritual influence have to be cast out. I got to fight tonight, Lord. I got to be delivered from this poor self-worth. I got to be delivered from this constant loneliness and depression. I got to be delivered from this witchcraft and sorcery. I got to be delivered from this financial poverty. Tonight, Lord, I'm asking you, set me free, Lord. 
And by faith, I forgive myself. By faith, I forgive those who sinned against me. Lord, I pray we take a moment. I pray you would search every man and every woman's heart and bring the spirit of revelation and truth. If there's someone that they've gotten to the point where they're just giving lip service, they're not forgiving from the heart. Tonight, we must forgive from our heart. We hate that evil that was done, but we must forgive the person. We must pray for the person. So, Heavenly Father, I pray for them right now. From my heart, I release this offense, this abuse, this abandonment, this betrayal, this molestation, this rape. I release it. And, Lord, you said, cast my care upon you because you care for me. I cast this care of this horror that happened to me in my life. And I pray for this individual. I pray for their soul. I pray they wouldn't go to hell for their sins. I pray they'd find mercy. They'd find Christ. I pray they wouldn't do that again to another person. I pray you'd stop it, Lord. This is my prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you for helping me tonight. Thank you for giving me Holy Spirit boldness. Thank you for giving me a Holy Spirit expectation. And Lord, let me not leave until I meet those expectations. I came here for a purpose. I had a vision of coming here, how I would feel when I left, how my life would be different starting when I walk out that door. I pray and I thank you for it happening in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If that's you. And you know you need to be free. You come on up to the front. You line up between that black mat and that carpet. The ministry team will come up. We're all going to pray for you. We've been praying for you already. My prayer is always, Lord, I'm excited that the day I came here and how my life changed, let that happen again tonight for somebody. Let them receive that life-changing experience with the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. I lay it down, Lord. I Just let it go. I've been prideful, Lord. I've been trusting in myself. I've been trusting in uncertain riches. I've been trusting my own power. I've been trusting in my own ability to navigate and have authority over sin. Lord, I lay it down right here at this altar, and I'm trusting the Holy Spirit. I'm trusting the Word of God. Uh, we say lies are bound at this altar. The devil's deception are bound on this altar. Witchcraft curses are bound on this altar. Spirits of depression and anxiety and fear are bound on this altar in the name of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we thank you for the Holy Spirit being loosed. We thank you for the Holy Spirit being loosed to set at liberty those who are oppressed of the devil. I come against every lie, every lie that infiltrated this these young people's mind come out of there you liar lies are not permitted we shut the door on the liar satan you are a liar you have lied to this woman you have lied to this man i command you to come out every lying devil all that hardness of heart you lying devil trying to harden their hearts you foul devil telling them there is no hope there is no future i bind your power you are not allowed here i command you to come out in jesus name i command you to come out all lust all lust and perversion i charge you in the name of jesus you lust perverted devil i command you to come out Come out of there. He's not going to die in fornication. He's not going to die a slave to sin. I command you to come out. Come out of there. All that poor self-worth from the porn. All that condemnation from the sexual sin. You come out of the man right now. Come out of there right now. Come out of there. Come all the way out of there right now. Come out of there. Keep going. Come out of there right now. Hold on. Come out of there. Come out of there, you foul devil. Come out of there. Come out of there. Stop stalling. All that rejection. I loose your hold. All that rejection. All that devil lies that he's not good enough. You come out that he won't be free. You come out of there. Come out of there. Come out of there. All that spiritual hardness in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you that they can fight from a position of power. I think that Holy Spirit power is available because we believe. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Help us, Lord, to fight from power. Thank you for helping us, and we fight from a position of power. We are not slaves to sin. The Bible said we are more than conquerors through Christ who gives us the strength. We are more than conquerors through Christ. Come out of there right now. All that wounded heart. 
all that wounded heart come out of there being wounded being rejected all the suffering from the lack of love come out of there all that suffering from the lack of love come out of there right now I command you to let the woman of God go I command you to let her go come out of there come out of all that bitterness all those satanic attacks come out of there all that fighting come out of there right now come out of there right now Come out of there right now. You get two more of those buckets. Come out of there. Keep going. They're coming. Come out of there. Come out of that brain. Come out of the fighting and quarreling. Come out. Spiritual complacency. Trusting in riches. Come out of there. The devil that told me I didn't have a call. My call was just to go to work. My call was just to be a righteous person. Come out of there. Come out of there right now in Jesus' holy name. We command you to get up and go. We command you to get up and go. Come out, that fighting and division. I command you to go. That fighting and division. I command you to go. In Jesus' name, I command you to go. Sir, don't swallow that bitterness. Come out of there. Bitterness towards my life. Bitterness towards ministers. Bitterness towards the Lord. That's all a deception. You come out of there. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for touching this woman. I thank you that today is the day. All the hurts. All the pain from her childhood, all the hurts and pains from her childhood, all the hurts and pains from those past relationships, all the hurts and pains affecting the body and the joints. Oh, we declare you're defeated, devil. I command you to come out right now being exhausted spiritually, being exhausted spiritually. The devil that blinds her to say, where's the hope? The Lord's not showing up. Oh, you're a liar, devil. You've been blocking the word of God. You've been blocking the miracles. You've been blocking the answer of God. You're a liar. And I command you to come out. I command you to come out. Take a nice big breath. Come out of there right now. I want you out of my body, devil. I want you out of my body. I'm sick and tired of going through the same cycle over and over and over again. I'm done with you. I draw the line in the sand. I say you're bound in my life. Every lie that you put in my head in my childhood, every lie that you put in my head through my adolescence, I uproot it in the name of Jesus, the Son of God. And I command you to come out. I command you to come out. Where do you think you need delivered from? What was, the, what was your thought when you came up? Uh huh. Oh. And this is your husband? Okay, everything's going good at home. Your kids are good. Your, your relationship's good. Uh, it, it wasn't that easy. And when did it all change? Oh, like weeks ago, months ago, years ago? Oh, weeks ago. So there was fighting. Oh, so when you're fighting, then your prayers get chopped down according to the, according to the Bible. So Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for new beginnings in the marriage, new beginnings in life. You're the God of new beginnings, Lord. We just repent of fighting. We repent of quarreling. We repent of disrespect to each other. And Lord, we thank you for forgiving us. We repent right now in the name of Jesus. I bind this foul spirit of division. I bind this foul spirit of distrust and mistrust. I bind all this foul devil out that says it's not going to get better, that it ain't going to be what you dreamt it would be. You are a liar. You're trying to deceive these people. And I command you to come out. All the hurts from the husband, I command you to come out. All the hurts from the husband, I command you to come out. All the hurts from the wife, all the hurts of myself because of what I did to my wife. You come out right now. Come out of there. All those spirits from past sins, you come out. Go ahead. Just go ahead and take this on your own. I'll help your wife. You got it. Come out. Come out of there. All the spirits from past sin. Come out of there. All that pride. All those spirits that came in in his teenage years. You come out of there right now. Come out of there. All the spirits from the husband's fighting. All that fighting. All that standing the ground. You come out right now. You come out right now. You come out right now. Hold on one second. You come out. Hold on. Come out of there right now. Come out of there right now. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Come out of that body. 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 Come out of that body in Jesus. All that bitterness. Come out. Hold on to that. Come out. All that bitterness. Bitter gall. Come out. Bitter envy. Come out of there right now. Fighting always caused bitterness. 
I command the bitterness to come out. I command all those foul spirits that came into their bodies before they were born again. You come out. You've been trespassing for years, you foul devil. Come out of there. Any kind of lust, any kind of word curse, any kind of greed, any kind of selfishness, you come out of that body. Any kind of drugs or alcohol abuse, come out of there. Hip hop, come out of there. Rap curses, come out of there right now. Heavy metal curses, all demons that came in that body. You come out of there right now. I charge you sexual deviance, this sexual dissatisfaction that will try to infiltrate the marriage of this couple. I loose you from their relationship. I command you to come out right now. Come out of there. Come out of there. All that lust from his youth. You come out of there. All that pride. All that pride that came from success in sports and success in the world. You come out of there right now. That does not work in marriages. You are an offense unto us. Come out of there right now. All that devils are causing back pain. You're messing with his back. Come out of there right now. I know who you are, you foul devil. You come out of there. You loose that back pain. You come out of there. Back pain. You come out of there. Back pain. You come out of there right now. Come out of there. All that back pain. All that sickness. You come out of the woman of God. Sickness on the body. Sickness on the joints. You come out of there in Jesus' name. You come out of there. Come out of there right now in Jesus' name. Keep coming out of there. Devils that say, my life's over. You're a liar. You say there's no hope for the future. You're a liar. God's mercies are made new every day. You come out of there right now. You told us she was an old woman. You're a liar, devil. This is a young woman. You come out of there right now. Come out of there. Come out of there right now. Fight them. Fight them. I'm not going down like that. Sir, what do you need to be delivered from? What do you think? From what? Diabetes. Diabetes. Oh, okay. Well, have you ever forgiven yourself? Yeah. Did you used to have low self-esteem and poor self-worth as a kid growing up? Okay. Because an autoimmune disease is, a, is when the body starts waging a war against itself. And normally it comes from negativity and abuse and abandonment, belittlement that comes as a, as a child. What's your first name? Robert. Albert? Robert. Oh, Robert. Heavenly Father, I thank you for Brother Robert. And I thank you that he's not alone. That you draw near to those who draw near to you, Lord. We're drawing near to you, Lord, in our time of need. And I thank you for the Holy Spirit comfort with Robert. The Lord, we're going to stand on the promises that he's a new man in Christ. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The old man passes away. We let that, that little boy go that was a failure and that was abused. We let that go of failing over and over in our life. And we thank you for new beginnings, Lord. And we repent of negative self-worth. We, re we repent of ever cursing ourselves, saying that we were, we were cursed or we were not blessed or a curse word towards our life. I repent of that in the mighty name of Jesus, the Son of God. And I command you, foul devil, you're going to come out of this man of God. You're going to come out of this man of God right now. I command you to come to attention and come out of there right now. You're going to stop tormenting his body. You're going to stop messing with his body and attacking his body. I charge you in the name and the authority of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I break, two big I break that hex. I break come out of there. That may have come come out of there nice and easy. A couple breaths, he'll go. Come out, devil. Devil bringing that diabetes, I command you to come out. All those devils of sickness, I command you to come out. I command you to stop tormenting Robert in the name of Jesus Christ. Stop tormenting the man of God in Jesus' name. Come out of there. Robert, you got a list of people that you have a hard time forgiving? In the name of Jesus. Nobody? Yeah. When did you get born again? How old were you when you got saved? In the mighty name of Jesus. We cancer your We break off every witchcraft curse. Yeah, what's been happening in those 25 years? In the name of Jesus Christ. Every fiery dart, every fiery arrow, every arrow of affliction. What was your ex wife's first name? Come up and off right now. Yeah? Have you forgiven her? Yeah. No negative emotions towards her? What happened? No negative emotion towards her or what happened in that relationship? No. Yeah. No. Do you believe in deliverance? Do you believe you got spirits? And you want them out? Okay, you gotta, you gotta use the hate. 
We you got to use the hate. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the wonderful gift of hate. I thank you that Robert can hate the devil, that he can hate this sickness that's going to try to shorten his life. Thank you for the Holy Spirit power of hate, to hate the wicked one, to hate destruction, to hate deception. Oh, we use it right now in the name of Jesus. Just speak to him. Devil, I hate what you've been doing to me. I, I do not permit you to do this anymore. I hate what you've been doing to me. You are an offense unto me, devil. You are an offense unto me. You've been wrecking my life for years. I command you to come out of me. Start, start talking to him, Robert. Start talking to him. I'm done with you. Today I say I'm done with you. Today I believe is my day to be free from the wicked one. I command all this shame. I command all this humiliation. I command all this self-disgust to go. Get out of that body in Jesus' name. Just tell him to go. Take a few big breaths, Robert. He'll go. He'll come right out in Jesus' name. Come out of there, shaky. Come out of there, arthritis. Arthritis from bitterness. Arthritis from taking offenses. All that offense-taking spirit. Being offended at classmates. Being offended at people and adults and pastors. Come out of there. That's a spirit of offense trying to get in those bones. I command you to come out. But what else do we think we need to pray for? Yeah, so... Can you say, can you, you said spirit of arguing? No, as besides of, of, of the arguments that we oh. had because of our frustration, no trust, oh. and, and, but it was, and, but recently we've been fighting for more finance, no money. Oh, okay. You know, it, it, it's even a tax yeah, okay. There's a lot of uh, uh, heat on our finances. Okay, let's pray for that. Well, Lord, we know that the plans that you have for us is that we would prosper and be in good health, even as our.
Come out of there. Come out of there. Let's go. Streamers, testing, testing, testing. I want to pray for you, streamers. Heavenly Father, I thank you for everybody watching. All oh, streamers. I tried to slow it down. I went too fast last week. But I hope you're with me. Yeah, one second, let me pray for this, this streamers. I'll be right to you. Thanks. I want to pray for you, streamers. I want to pray you made it through this far for a reason. I want to pray a blessing on you. I received the Holy Spirit power oh, through a minister that prayed over the television. I saw him one time, and God did it that special way because I would have faith that somebody watching my ministry would be able to receive the Holy Spirit, not subjected to time or space, even if you're watching this video on replay on Facebook. Heavenly Father, I pray for these streamers that need the Holy Spirit power. I pray right now that the Holy Spirit power would come down upon them and fill them. It would shake the, the house in which they're sitting, Lord. I pray there'd be a shaking in their inner man. I pray there'd be a shaking in the spirit to revival, that they would be revived from their sleep and their slumber. They'd be revived from their spiritual stupor. I pray for that Holy Spirit power to come upon them to bring the spirit of revelation, the spirit of truth. I thank you for the gifts of the Holy Spirit going into activation in their lives, no longer dormant, no longer being spiritually docile, but coming alive through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I thank you for moving, Lord. And by faith, streamers, just use that power. Use that power right now. Satan, take your hands off me right now. Mental illness, take your hands off me. You lying assassin, take your hands off me right now in Jesus' name. Take this sickness and disease. Take this bitterness and go. I command you to go. Take this heart attack. Take this lung failure. Take all this cancer and go in the mighty name of Jesus, the Son of God. Leave my life. Leave my life. You're bound in my life. You're an offense to me. Oh, I'm standing on the Word of God. The Word of God is loosed in my life. The Word of God is loosed in my life. Devil, stop lying to them. Oh, you need to be healed, streamers. Just reach your hand out to the screen. Heavenly Father, I pray the Holy Spirit power would touch these bodies. Oh, touch these bodies, Heavenly Father. Touch the broken bones and joints and tendons and marrow and ligaments and death, disc. Touch these dry bones. Touch this endocrine system. Touch the central nervous system. Touch the brain and the heart, the liver, the lungs, the pancreas, the gallbladder, the prostate. Thank you for touching the reproductive organs which were damaged. I pray healing right now. I thank you, Jesus Christ, for healing their broken bodies. Just receive it, streamers. I receive the healing in my body. I thank you, Lord. You are my Lord that healeth thee. I receive it by faith. You want me well. The leper came and said, if you want me well, you can make me clean. He said, I do want to. And he was healed at that very hour. Be healed by faith in Jesus Christ. Be healed by having faith in God's holy word. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. Sometimes you got to praise your way out. If you haven't got a breakthrough yet, there's still a way out. If you tried yelling, you tried standing, and it didn't work, there's still another way. It's 
to praise your way out. Heavenly Father, I thank you. Thank you for every trouble and every hardship. Thank you for every disappointment. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for every bad thing that ever happened, Lord. Oh, because what it does, it proves, Lord, that the devil couldn't take it all. He was coming for it all, but he couldn't take it all. The fact that he couldn't take it all proves you love me. It proves that you kept him back. It proves that he could only go so far. It proves that you're an authority. It proves that you're God. And Heavenly Father, I'm tired of kicking against the goads. I'm tired against fighting against you, Lord. I'm tired of rebelling against you. Lord, I offer up a song of praise. I offer up a thank you. I offer up a, I praise your holy name. I love you. I worship you. Now just let it go, streamers. This is your chance. This is your way out. Is a praise. Praise your way out. I give you praise for everything. I give you praise that it's looking bad because you're able to now make a way out. I give you praise, Lord, that I don't have to trust in myself. If I did, I wouldn't make it. I give you praise that I can trust in you. I give you praise for every scripture that is true, that you're my ever-present help in need. The thanks goes to, you'll never leave me. You'll never forsake me. Oh, you promised to finish what you began. For that, I say thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah and amen. Streamers, we love you. Brother Mike, somebody will be back tomorrow preaching. Same channel, same time. Tomorrow, God bless you. And thank you for your prayers for us. Amen.